welcome to another Unitas FIDE interview. Um, today we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Miroslav Wolf, who is the Henry B. Wright Professor of Systematic Theology at Yale Divinity School and the director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. He is the author of, a, of dozens of books and publications, including our book for today, the 2002 uh, Grauemeyer Award-winning Exclusion and Embrace, a Theological Exploration of Identity, Otherness, and Reconciliation. Dr. Wolf, thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here with you. Excellent. Now, could you give us just a general overview of the book and why you felt the topic of exclusion and embrace was needed in a theological treatment? Well, uh, the, the book is really about um, conflicts that rage around the question of uh, identity. Obviously, other things are involved in these conflicts as well, but it, they have uh, as one of their prominent features the problem of uh, identity. And whether that's national identity, religious, cultural, ethnic identity. And Christian faith has a lot to say about conflicts, but Christian faith also had to say, has to say a lot about identity. That latter question has not been sufficiently explored, and then the connection between the two hasn't been explored uh, well either. And so this is what I'm, I have attempted to, to do from the kind of heart of the Christian faith to explore what Christian faith has to say about the conflicts uh, that rage around identity. And I myself am in uh, part of the such conflict, uh, having, uh, having grown in uh, uh, Croatia and my country being caught up in a conflict of this sort. So it was kind of giving an account uh, to myself of how uh, Christian faith bears upon the um, upon the issues of how, how should I behave uh, as a Christian in the context in which I was. Fantastic. Now, in the opening chapters of this book, you mention events and places that are very personal to you. How have these personal experiences kind of influenced the formation of this book and its project as a whole? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the, the book itself is rooted uh, or occasioned by events in my immediate uh, biography places where I lived. Um, and in that sense, it kind of set the agenda. They set the questions which I sought myself to, uh, to answer. But my experience was that closer that I delved into the particularities of my own situation, the more universal actually uh, what I had to say or what the Christian faith had to say with regard to that situation uh, became. That's a kind of paradox which we see also in other settings. I remember I was once in um, I uh, visited a number of times Cairo, and uh, I used to read that Najib Mahfouz, uh, who was an Egyptian uh, writer, and went to Cairo and went to a coffee shop where he used to work uh, his entire life. And basically, he left Cairo only twice in his life, once to go to, uh, to Great Britain and the other time to go to Yugoslavia, a country of my own uh, origin, and that's it. He wrote this incredible opus uh, right there in Cairo, in that coffee shop. Uh, <laughs> it is so particular. And yet I, as a person from a different part of the world, uh, indeed, who traveled across the globe and lived in many places, could uh, uh, identify with and find myself in the story that he was telling. And I think I've experienced something similar as a theologian. Um. So you mentioned in the book Sarajevo, Berlin, and Los Angeles that are cities that you kind of noted had influenced your uh, view of identity and exclusion. And that was before you came to New Haven, Connecticut to teach at Yale. How has your time at Yale and New Haven contributed to and informed this outlook? Well, of course, uh, yeah, New Haven has its own uh, issues uh, and problems with identity. In the United States, it's always also a question of um, African-American uh, experience, Native American experience, other forms of identities uh, that are there. 
but that wasn't so much new. All right, that was similar to what I've experienced before. I think what Yale, uh, New Haven, and particularly Yale brought is kind of an uh, a heightened awareness that there is a fundamental theological question that even precedes the question of identity. And that is the question of the shape of our living, uh, question of the nature of our humanity, question of the meaning of our lives. And it's this question that has been in intellectual circles for various reasons, uh, marginalized the significant question. Now, um, it took arriving to Yale and be spending time at Yale to realize that that's a phenomenon or, or to appreciate sufficiently that that's a significant phenomenon. And that has then shaped the whole new phase of my work, which is an alternative to, to earlier work on identity uh, or uh, on, uh, on grace, but it's uh, a particular angle to take um, on that uh, position. And so what was the central question of the Christian faith, namely, what is the shape of your living and what's the role, what, what is the role of God in the shape of that living? That uh, mm -hmm. came before and I think has become a very important question for me. Now, you speak of the need to be self-conscious of your identity while not attempting to expunge it, leading to a sort of tension between identity and exclusionary behaviors. Uh, how do you think we can balance the two without losing ourselves? Well, I think it's very important to, um, to differentiate or distinguish between um, kind of identity constituting processes of differentiation and uh, phenomenon of exclusion. Without differentiation, there's no identity. Without okay. differentiation and maintenance of boundaries, uh, all identities would be uh, dissolved. So the boundary maintenance and therefore the process of um, um, both legitimizing and uh, enacting differentiations are fundamental to our, uh, our identity. Um, and I distinguish that from uh, processes of exclusion. And processes of exclusion, so you can put it this way, Ident uh, differentiation brings identity into existence. Exclusion either er erases them or takes them out of the sphere of our care. Um, and I think if we make this kind of a distinction in principle, uh, in concrete cases, we might be then able to discern uh, what's at stake here. Is it at stake here now erasure of the identity uh, or is it at stake and therefore of my of existence or what is at stake is, uh, is actually establishment of, of the identity. Clearly in many instances, there's gonna be a tension between these two and that that's going to require a process of discernment and the process of, uh, of um, acting in a responsible uh, way. Sometimes also acting in absence of fear, what, what sometimes leads us to confl conflate uh, exclusion with, uh, with differentiation or to, feel th to, to think that anything that uh, pushes against our boundaries uh, is the form of exclusion, is uh, a kind of fear of losing identity, not having a very supple kind of identity, but rather very rigid uh, identities that, that are then the flip side of exclusionary practices. Now, it was interesting that on page 77, you mentioned that technology has both helped expose exclusionary behavior as well as play into hedonistic desires on our part that desensitize us from others' pain. How has technology either aided or harmed exclusion and embrace? And how do you see technology factoring into this in the future? You know, technology develops and technology is a tool and it shapes our, it would be both use it and it also shapes our behavior. So when we use it, it magnifies both the good and the ill that we, uh, that we perpetrate. Uh, mm -hmm. And it sometimes shapes our behavior. And examples of the older style of use of technology, both to make us aware of exclusion and to 
uh, and to perpetrate exclusion is the, the example of use of, say, radio in, um, in Rwanda, or for that matter, television and radio also in uh, the country from, uh, from where I come. They become a propaganda tools. Uh, so mass media are the tools of shaping imagination of the entire populations, uh, identifying threats to, to us, uh, naming those threats as, uh, as, as the um, insidious agents of evil that seek to destroy us and therefore mobilize um, a, a sense of, um, of urgency in order to attend to those and therefore to persecute uh, folks, as was the case in, uh, certainly case in, in Rwanda. Um, um, obviously, um, those same mass media uh, have made us aware of what was going on in Rwanda. Uh, so that both things are the case. We have similar things uh, going on in so more modern social, social media. They also contribute to a certain sense of exclusion, especially as they allow us to be at a distance from a, another uh, and inhabit our own small enclaves of, uh, of common opinion and um, then um, allow us not to encounter people as a flesh and blood human beings, but rather as kind of images that we perceive from a, from a distance. And we end up saying things we normally wouldn't say. We end up doing things we normally wouldn't do because we live at a distance from those upon whose behavior or upon whom our behavior has uh, effects. Huh. Now, you mentioned that God's reception of humanity is a model for how we should embrace those who are otherwise hostile to us. What would you say to those who might reply that actually implementing such infinite forgiveness is just unrealistic on our part? Well, I think infinite, uh, implementing infinite forgiveness would be yeah. unrealistic, uh, certainly unrealistic, <laughs> unrealistic on our part. Uh, I think um, um, on the one hand, uh, it, it's very clear from um, um, multiple texts in the New Testament that both God and Christ serve as a model of human, uh, human behavior. Indeed, we ought to pattern our Christ, life on Christ. Uh, be perfect as your heavenly father is, is perfect. At the same time, it's also clear that we aren't God, that we aren't Jesus Christ. So there is a kind of difference between the two. And model might not be the best term to, uh, to apply. In any case, it would be kind of analogous relationship rather than one-to-one -one relationship. But I think there's something more profound. Even as we say, follow Christ and do as Christ did, we do it in our human way, but also we don't do it simply in our human strength. And you can see that um, there are many ways to illustrate that, but one way to illustrate that is to, to, is to point to the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of Christ. He acted in the power of the Spirit. Now, it's the same Spirit that was on Christ that is promised to rest on Christians, so that they can enact in different circumstances the kind of life that he, that he led. So the, the relationship is not simply that of modeling, see and, uh, and emulate, but rather the relationship is, yes, see and emulate, but emulate in the power of that same spirit that has led Jesus Christ um, so that we can live in today's environment in our own human way uh, we leave out something similar to what Christ lived out. Now, another element that plays heavily into your considerations of embrace is this idea of freedom. How does a confused notion of freedom lead to exclusion and the notion of self-sovereignty? Uh, I think our uh, modern uh, notions of freedom are... Uh, relatively closely tied to our self-understanding as self-enclosed uh, sovereign, as you as you mentioned, individuals. Now, um, to sovereign individuals are like billiard balls. <laughs> they yeah. roll, uh, and then when they bump uh, into each other, they 
kind of collide. They don't have a porous boundaries uh, where somehow the one billiard ball would shape the how internally billiard ball understands itself and behaves, right? Um, and if and that, that's why I think that we need a um, different sense of identity than the individual self-enclosed individuals. And that different sense of identity is a person, persons with porous boundaries. That for me is, is symbolized with the metaphor of embrace. Uh, I open my arms and embrace something that isn't me. And by embracing something that isn't me, I enrich my identity. That's exemplified in uh, in uh, in Christ in different ways in which Christ embraces uh, humanity. That can be also illustrated in a very simple way. If one thinks, for instance, about what happens when you travel to another country. I mean, I uh, I tend to buy. Uh, uh, small objects of art, uh, and then I bring them into my home, um, and I'm surrounded uh, by them. Now, before I brought these things from outside into my home, my home was constituted a certain way. When that object came in, uh, that become part of my home, and identity of my home and my own identity has been reshaped. It symbolizes my experience that has been enriched, but now I'm a different person. And this is a constitu f fundamental constitu uh, constitutional feature of human identity, that we are not completely self-enclosed, that our boundaries are porous. And that's the, this, this distinction between that we talked about earlier between differentiation and exclusion. I can have differentiation even if many of the things and encounters that I have shape uh, the nature of my identity. But that means also that the presence of the other is not limited to my freedom, but also can enhance my, my freedom. I can be enriched by a, another uh, rather than simply stay self-enclosed. Uh, self um, I think another, uh, another uh, feature of uh, modern freedom is, is generally construed as negative freedom, freedom from something. And I think we need to enrich it uh, with the idea that Eric Fromm, um, um, a thinker from a previous generation, has emphasized uh, very strongly, and that's freedom for. This kind of freedom for is a fundamental human, human freedom that we ought not forget. Huh. Now, there's a strong focus on an eschatological hope for the conditions of embrace noted in this book. I think this is a key element for Christians to realize in constructing any theology. Uh, do you see a tendency for contemporary Christianity to neglect this classical eschatological focus? And what are some of the implications? Yeah, those are many of you, the questions that you pose are, are, are really huge questions, and we have a <laughs> little time to yeah. address them. This yeah. is also, uh, also one of them. Mm. Uh, I think that's, that it's, it's a very important to have this uh, eschatological um, um, kind of expectation and therefore always eschatological questioning of, mm -hmm. of a place where we find ourselves both in, in, in terms of um, um, preventing uh, uh, or pushing against the sense that we have already arrived yeah. Also pushing it against the sense that arrival at any moment is possible. And I'm very much concerned about this kind of almost like a perfectionist streak in uh, much of the modern, uh, modern thinking, uh, much right. of the modern social uh, critique. Perfectionist streak also in uh, some of our individual types of uh, kinds of behavior so that we can't quite live understanding ourselves, as Luther put it, as simul justus et peccator. We are at the same time sinners and justified. And uh, a kind of awareness of our own, not just fragility but, and vulnerability, but also our fallibility is, needs to be built into the very striving for the goals which we have both in terms of personal sanctification, but also in terms of uh, social transformation. That seems to me essential. And say, if, if you think about uh, forgiveness, 
if you want some kind of eschatologically pure type of forgiveness, you're going to never have forgiveness. You're going to always have a, a have kind of imperfection, and therefore you're always going to uh, be short, and you may not even uh, uh, even venture into the world of forgiveness because it's it's a messy, unclear world, and yet the unclear world of forgiveness, which moves you exactly to be closer to who God is and who God uh, wants us to be. Love the use of, uh, of uh, Luther's classic paradigm there. Um, and one thing I found very surprising in the book is your great familiarity with and uh, use of the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche. Um, known more commonly for his work, the Antichrist, and his kind of anti-Christian ethic. What do you think is the value for Christianity today in studying and interacting with Nietzsche? Um, Nietzsche is a, is a fascinating, uh, fascinating figure. I, for maybe two years, uh, I read him for devotions. <laughs> at, at night stand, and every night I would read a uh, portion a little bit of Nietzsche. This is how I went to sleep. Now that seems like a, like a crazy idea for a theologian to do, especially for a theologian like I am, who's, uh, who has a kind of deep um, uh, kind of classical orthodox uh, convictions. But I found it always really important to see myself and see the faith also through the eyes of another, through the eyes of a radical critic, and Nietzsche is uh, th there are there there are kind of uh, good critics and bad critics, and good critics are are, are really smart critics. That is those who know uh, and understand in a deep way the faith, maybe sometimes in a deeper way than I myself uh, un understand it. Um, some of the modern uh, critics, if I take the new atheists, they, they seem to me very superficial. They, they don't know uh, faith. They, they, they have never properly studied it. Uh, they approach it uh, kind of uh, almost, almost, they have a, they have a catechism understanding of faith, uh, almost like a faith of the 10-year-old, and that's the faith they, they critique. But Nietzsche was a profoundly, a profoundly um, uh, um, deep thinker, a profound thinker, and knew faith well. And his criticisms uh, of faith, uh, therefore, bear much more weight. And I ought to take them into account as I think about the nature of faith and how it's being lived in today's world. Now, you note Foucault's view of truth is something that is produced as opposed to a transcendental principle. And that this has kind of seeped into the subconsciousness of contemporary thought. How is this related to, do you think, to exclusionary behaviors? Um, some believe, some people believe the truth in self or claims to truth are exclusionary. Yeah. And uh, well, much of the attraction of something like uh, truth being produced is that it kind of allows you to step back from this sense that truth claims exclude uh, uh, folks. Um, and obviously, um, the, the making of truth claims can be done in very much an exclusionary, exclusionary way, but I think that um, even more oppressive and dangerous than even exclusionary truth claims are exclusionary falsehoods that pass as truth claims, <laughs> right? So you've got Absolutely. a fake news uh, is, is a huge problem that we are facing uh, today, or by the way, uh, kind of culturally taken for granted, but morally false and deeply oppressive stances. That, that too. Um, and many examples can be given of, of these. They are kind of uh, exclusionary in ways that you, that's very hard to, to call into, into question, right? Unless you have something like 
the notion of truth to which they ought to be uh, held accountable. And I remember uh, talking to some of my friends who share more um, Foucault's uh, account of, of truth uh, during the, the, the Iraq war. And suddenly it became a very important for them for there to be something like truth. And obviously uh, the, the claims were made by, by powerful regimes, whether that's by Tony Blair or George W. Bush, that Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons. That was a justification of, uh, of at least one, us, one, one element of justification for the war in Iraq. Uh, but it turned out that he didn't, right? And it mattered whether Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons or not. It was not a matter of regimes of truth here. It was a matter of factual knowledge, whether that was the case uh, or not. Hmm. And I think a kind of a richer account of truth can both take into account that, in fact, there are such things as regimes of truth that are produced, that where truth is produced, but also that there is such a thing as a notion of truth or, or, or the, the transcendental uh, understanding of truth as applying to every time and every place uh, is also significant precisely uh, in order to ward against um, uh, forms of oppressive uh, behavior. I think every untruth in some sense is also a form of injustice. Hmm. And especially uh, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to interhuman relations, uh, and that has to be kept in mind. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, so between when you initially wrote the book and now, have you changed your mind on anything or, you know, is there anything that you wish you could have changed or added and why? Oh my goodness! There, there are all sorts of little, little things. Uh, Another broad question, I know. <laughs> yeah, sometimes bigger, bigger things that I, I wish I have said, uh, said differently. Uh, every sentence could have been said uh, differently, uh, and the number of different points could have explicated differently. You know what? Let me put it this way: uh, next month, I will be doing a revision of ex uh, exclusion and embrace, and uh, second edition. Now, after 23 years, uh, mm -hmm. will will wow. be published published next year, uh, and then um, your your listeners and viewers will be able to compare. <laughs> See what I learn in the meantime. Yeah. <laughs> well, we're we're very excited. So, one last question, and this is another broad question. Um, what do you think are some of the greatest challenges to Christian theology, um, especially looking forward kind of to the next 20 years or so, and why? Um, you know, it's, uh, the humanity is facing, uh, facing great challenges, uh, I think, and the challenges humanities are, of the humanity are challenges uh, of, the Christian, uh, of the Christian faith. Um, and they're challenges of the Christian faith because... Um, um, the world is God's creation. Uh, human beings are um, God's children, and uh, God's goal for creation is to become God's home and human home uh, in, in one. And I, I think one of the uh, obviously, uh, obviously, I, I do believe that uh, that um, uh, ecological crisis is one of the one of the great challenges uh, of, of our time, uh, and it's really a challenge of faith, also uh, faith in the goodness of creation, um, and proper understanding of that. I think for myself, uh, probably the most most significant issue is uh, actually the nature of humanity itself. Hmm. And how do we deal, on the one hand, with uh, plural constructions and conceptions of what it means to be a human being, whether that comes from the secular side of things or from other uh, religious uh, traditions? So that is to say we have uh, multiple visions of the nature of humanity and what we ought to be uh, about, and we have to negotiate uh, these. At the same time, also, I think that the nature of humanity is, is being, um, there's a push against the edges of the nature of humanity 
with recent technological uh, and scientific developments, whether that's gene editing or artificial intelligence. And I think that side too calls upon us to reflect um, what it means to be human. Why is it good to be only human, <laughs> uh, right? Um, because it must be good to be only human because God created us as humans so that the limits of humanity, the fragility of humanity, the, the, the incompleteness of, of humanity uh, has to be seen as a positive good rather than always in some kind of misplaced desire to be more than human, to be quasi-divine, to leave those created realities behind. Now, reflection upon what that means and how life should be then lived in its various uh, aspects from birth to death and everything that happens in between. I think that's the great challenge, theological challenge of our time, how to do that in the light of the fact that we were created by God. God redeemed us in Jesus Christ and God designed is for us to find home uh, together with God in the new heavens and new earth. Well, amen to that. Dr. Volk, there's certainly more questions I could ask you, but uh, our time is up. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview. My pleasure. My pleasure. Good to talk to you.